So, um, yeah, here we go. Let's get started. A few kind of housekeeping things before we dive in. Um, I'm quilting and you honestly can't see her this morning. I'll give you a better view in a moment of, of my long arm, Lucy. So I'm quilting on a Gamel 26 inch, but the work that I'll be doing today is entirely freehand. I do have their Elevate system, which is digitized. Don't use it very often. Freehand is my love and today's project is for sure entirely freehand. We call these sessions live and unscripted because that's what they are. We are streaming them to you initially live. We do sometimes go back and edit off, as I mentioned the earlier um, hello clips, but the whole show then will remain present just live as it happens. So you get to see the whole thing rolling out. Sometimes there are oopses and thread breaks and a few episodes ago I actually ran out of backing before I ran out of quilt. And so you just get to see me run into those roadblocks in real time and how I resolve them. So this is not per se a class and I'm not trying to teach you this is the way to do everything, but it's the way that I do it. And I feel like it's really advantageous, especially for novice quilters, to get to sort of look over someone's shoulder into their studio and just see some of these things in real time. So that's what this is all about. If you enjoy this show, please hit the like and subscribe, hit the bell and you'll get notifications of when I am going live and that will help you to find it. And please share this video with other quilters that you think might benefit. I do all my demos on a long arm and so it's particularly geared toward long armors, but a lot of the designs lend themselves to quilting on domestic machines as well and topics like thread choices and things like that. So do share with your quilting friends. I would appreciate that. Also, if you are interested in supporting this show, that is very easy to do. You know that I love my coffee, and in fact, I should grab my mug and be sipping, shouldn't I? And I'm standing away from the quilt very carefully. But you can just go to buymeacoffee.com forward slash stitched by Susan. And there, for as little as the price of one coffee, you can make a one-time donation or a membership if you so choose. We really do appreciate your support, and that's how we keep... Um, advancing and improving our camera system and, and mics and things like that. And one of these days I'll remember to catch a snapshot of Dave, Mr. Producer, on the other side and all the gear that he's got because it's, it's quite involved. And one other place that you can find me is on my podcast and it's called Measure Twice, Cut Once. And it is interviews almost entirely interviews with other crafters mostly quilters and some of them are business people some of them are just crafting for a hobby some of them it's their relief or their therapy so it's just telling their stories and kind of what they've learned and just casual visits with other crafters so that's the podcast um, you can find all those episodes at podcast.stitchedbysusan.com and one last thing today we always have some lovely guitar music playing in the background and that's our good friend Dan who lets us use that music on our show. Dan's wife passed away this last week and um, she's been ill for a little while but it was fairly sudden at the end and in uh, gosh try not to get emotional in support of Dan if you wish Dave is going to put up a GoFundMe account um, just to help with some of the medical expenses that were incurred and sort of things that are ongoing and settling up the things that he needs to settle. So if you wish, no pressure at all. But it is Dan whose music we play every week and we do so appreciate him letting us broadcast that. It is just a treasure. Um, Dave is putting the link in the comments. We're not going to put it in the main show, uh, but the link is in the comments if you wish to access that, okay? So, sip of coffee. How are we doing for time, Mr. Producer, sir? Ready to move in, dive in? Okay, so I began loading because this is a longish project and I kind of thought I might get things ready this morning, but again, if you were following me on Instagram, I did a reality show before the reality show because the reality at my house this morning was I was literally finishing up the last vintage quilt and unloading it quickly this morning <laughs> in time to load this one up for this show. So um, that's kind of how it went. So you'll get to see part of the loading process this morning. If you want to see that in more depth, look back at some of the other episodes. Some of them I really focus on the loading, but today I'll just get through it as quickly as I can because there's so many other topics that we want to talk about today, all right? So I've got the front already snappered on and the remainder of the backing, I'm gonna toss over the long arm rails and out the other side 
and then you're apt to get a good view of the back of my head while I come around and clip it on that side. Oh, hang on, need one more, one more stretch here. Whoops. You'll notice when I'm doing the, I never know when to call it the front or the back, but the other end of the backing on this side, um, there's a piece added on to it. And this is because the backing was just a little bit short for the quilt, not very much, probably just an inch or two. And so we had a couple of choices there. And I always like telling you guys about my choices and why I made the one I did. And then that might help you when you come to making your own to sort of evaluate. Anyway, because we were such a little bit short, it didn't seem worthwhile to get a whole third length of fabric um, to make it longer. And there's various ways we can do that. You know, you could get half a length, cut it in half, piece it, etc. But we didn't have the fabric handy. It's about a half an hour to the fabric store. So what... Um, the quilt owner and I decided to do was to just add a strip of coordinating solid on that end and then she is going to write some messages in it after the quilt is finished and then in addition because I was only an inch or two short we made the decision to add eight inches on to the end so it would be a little broader and not just uh, it wouldn't look like a skinny little strip added on do you know what I mean and it would look a little more intentional. So that's what we have done at this end. And I chose to put that on the end where I'll be quilting first so that I can know exactly where the edge of my quilt is falling on that. Does that make sense? Where if it was at the bottom end, I wouldn't quite know where it would end up on the quilt. So I'm using my trusty red snappers, which we have certainly talked about. And I learned something this week that I'll tell you because it was news to me. I have told you before that you can find them sometimes on Amazon. And I, um, you can also find them at a little shop called Quilts on the Corner. I don't know that it's a little shop. A shop. Anyway, I learned this week that Quilts on the Corner is actually who makes them. So it is their product. So that is the very best place to go for them. I'm just going to walk all the way around because I have wires in the way. I need a shorter, shorter piece rather than such a long one. Dave's going to try and put up a link in the comments for you. It's taking a moment to find it, but that's the very best place to shop for them. If you wanted to tell them I sent you, you could. I don't have any kind of affiliate agreement with them, but I might ask for one and it would be nice to, to sort of know that I'm sending people to them. Anyway, red snapper system, that's what I use to quickly snap that in place. And now we'll continue rolling it up. And there we have it. All right, and now I'm just gonna run for my back, my batting. What I'm using is Hobbs 8020. This is kind of my all-purpose favorite batting. Um, the 80 is cotton, the 20 is polyester. So it's a very, um, it's durable, it's washable if need be. It's got a, a moderate amount of loft. It's not as fluffy as a wool, but considerably fluffier than just cotton. And I think my batting width is quite, quite wide. I believe I'm gonna trim some of this off just so this excess is not kind of in the way as I'm working. I've learned the hard way that if you have too much excess batting hanging, it just gets caught up in the rollers and side clamps and is just a nuisance. So I have a good friend who uses these little scraps so I don't feel guilty at all about cutting a foot off of there. Okay. So our batting is laid on top, smoothing that all out in place. 
I do want it to be quite close to the top so I get a lot of that aqua in the quilt, in the backing. So my friend who brought this quilt to me, her name is Janet, and she has a lovely daughter-in-law, Carla. So I'm not 100% sure who this quilt is ending up with of the two of them. Um, but Janet has a keen eye for vintage quilts. And she's always finding these gems of projects. I will try to show you it a little bit. Dave, could I see the main camera while I do this? Let's see if I can show you this a little bit. Yeah, it almost gets camouflaged in the one behind me, hey? So I'm still seeing your, your screen, Dave. There we go. Bird's eye view. So pretty colors, the green and the pink that are in the central areas are quite nice. Um, let me just make sure I've got this on the wrong way. I gotta count rings here. One, two, three, four, five. Okay, the other way, one, two, three, four. Good thing I counted. Um, a few thoughts. So many thoughts in my head. A few thoughts. If you watch frequently, you'll know that I often load my quilt with the length going this way. If it's not directional for any reason, that is my preference, just because it means fewer advances of the quilt, right? The short area is going this way. So that's usually my first choice. But then there's a couple other factors that I consider. One of them is the seams on the backing. I also like those to go horizontally. So sometimes I have to weigh because I can't have both those factors. It's one or the other. In this case, the quilt is not particularly directional, but I do want that aqua to be as much of it as I can include on the backing. And also I'm trying to keep it a little bit narrower for camera purposes. So that's why today I've chosen to load my quilt lengthwise this way. You always have options. There's not one, at least as far as loading the quilt, there's not one absolutely right way to do it. I expect you can see as I'm laying this out that there is a ton of unevenness and bubbles. Pretty much every white area is pulled into the prints, whether it's this section or the little melon shapes. So that's gonna be the big old challenge today. And seriously, we're kind of trying to pull a quilted rabbit out of a hat today because I, as I said earlier, I'm not 100% sure how this will turn out. You guys get to go on this exploring journey with me. So there it is by and large. Can you see I've got this line right here, I've got pulled out about as flat as it can go. In other words, I can't pull more this way. Um, that's all laying flat. Likewise, these melons. But then you're seeing all this excess. That's going to be the challenge of the day. So, I think we'll start by actually pinning some of this in place so that we can distribute that fullness. I think Maybe we should talk about fullness for a second. It is something that comes up so often in quilts is having this excess, either borders that are poofy or centers that are poofy, or in this case, particular areas of blocks that are poofy. And to me, the most important thing is that in some way you distribute it as evenly as you can. So it doesn't all end up in one place or another. That's when it becomes really unmanageable. Um, so my, my kind of goal for this then is I'll kind of you know, put my quilt kind of in half and then in quarters and then within I'll start managing that excess. And you'll see as we get to actually quilting, I'll kind of break down these bubbles in the same way. I may put a pin, you know, in places that divide up. So it's kind of dividing and conquering. So let's go ahead and pin some of this extra. Now, my machine has a 26 inch throat, so there's a very long depth here. This is kind of arm's length for me. So I'm actually gonna roll my quilt back a little bit. I won't have as big of a quilting area as I sometimes do, um, but I'm gonna choose to give that up for the ease of having it closer to me and easier to work on. So another choice. Choices, choices.
And while I pin this, remember too, I'm not going to attempt to do this whole quilt today. It's going to be a long project. So I'm going to work on it for a while today so that you see all the steps, the basting, the quilting, etc. And then tomorrow morning, I'm going to come back at 10 o'clock and finish it. And depending on how far I get today is sort of how much work I'll do tonight in between time. So you'll sort of get to see the beginning and the end, but I promise I will show all the steps that are involved. So rolling it toward me has had one other benefit. The melons are now sitting right along my front rail and that's enabling me to verify that in fact this is pretty smooth. It's neither squunched in this way nor stretched out that way too far. Another thing while I'm pinning, Dave is, has put up another camera for this episode and he's going to show another angle. And would you guys just chime in, is that helpful to see another larger view or is that just confusing to be looking at it from yet another direction? And we might try this on a couple shows and ask a bunch of people and based on your feedback then we'll decide whether that's something we want to continue doing, whether it's useful and helpful or not. So I'm just working my way now around these curves, smoothing them out as best I can. I'm going to mention one other critical thing. With so many of my quilts that are rectangular, which camera am I on? <laughs> that one, oh boy, now I'm really confused. We're going to have to name them one, two, and three, and Dave's going to have to hold up camera one, camera two. Anyway, um, when I have a rectangular quilt, like yesterday's vintage, for example, um, I'm pre-measured like before I loaded it because it was so irregularly shaped I measured it in several places in all directions and I decided in advance what size it was going to be basically the smallest areas across and then I pulled in excess where I needed to and in other episodes you've seen me run my lovely pink tape measure all the way across and that's my guideline going down I've opted not to for this quilt because it's not square so there's no corners and even, I mean, I could have measured, I guess, the sides of my scallops. But trust me, there are so many things we've got to manage already in this quilt that I made the decision that I'm going to let that area of perfection go. And I'm just going to get it as smooth and as flat as I can. Um, I usually, um, I'm having a hard time with words this morning. I usually block my quilts after they're finished too. So that's an option for squaring it up just a little bit, misting it with water, you know, smoothing it out on a blocking board or on a carpeted area of the floor and kind of managing its squareness that way. But I don't think I can manage its squareness and quilt and concentrate on getting out all the fullness. Make sense? So again, I've made some des decisions about what's most important and what I can focus on because I don't know that I can get everything in. So, meantime, while I'm chattering, I'm just working my way around all these scallops, just pulling them not tight, but as flat as I can and pinning every two inches or so. There's not a terrible ripple on the edge, so that's fairly good actually. And Mr. Producer, if you would just point whenever you change cameras, that would help me and then I'll try. <laughs> I'll try and look at the camera that you're on. <laughs> so many things to think about. Okay, hang on a sec. Dave and I get very casual here, so I apologize for the kind of off-camera conversation that goes on. Okay, here comes a comment. Joan, Dave, you're a gem. Thanks for doing what you do so I can learn from Susan. She's blessed to have you. You know, true, true story. Dave just wants the whole gem to go on record. But it is absolutely true. This is not a one-man show. I could not do this on my own. Okay, so we've got our perimeter that's, you know, visible, pretty well basted. Again, where am I, Dave? Okay. Still on that one. <laughs> Again, in the interests of how square it's going to be, um, I'm just visually using the front of my rail as this kind of visual guide that these melons are running straight. And every time I advance, I'll do the same thing. I'll visually check 
any straight line on my quilting machine. It can be the red snapper for the top. It can be the front of my roller here. And so I'm just keeping an eye on things so that it doesn't go badly wonky as I'm advancing and I get to the last row and one side is two inches longer because that could happen. But I'm going to manage that with each pass. So as with so many areas of quilting, but particularly when you're dealing with excesses and irregularities, the key is to keep on top of it, to never let it get away from you because that's when you end up with pleats and with terribly unsquare areas. So that's the goal. All right. Could I have, um, bear with me just a second. I've just got a lot of lint in my, in my um, hopper foot here. I'm just going to clean that out a little bit. Maybe now is a good time if you guys have any questions because I'm actually going to change my thread. I don't care for the thread that I've got loaded on here. And I am going to switch thread color to a soft cream. I have a darker neutral in and I just don't care for it. So while I run for another spool of thread and a bobbin, Dave can surf back and see if he has any great questions. And if you want to pop some up on screen, I will talk while I do this process and I'll be bobbing in and out of camera as I change my spool of thread over. And by the way, and I'll just add as an insert while he's hunting, I don't re-thread my machine when I do this. I've walked around the back of it to my spool and I'm just, I've cut the spool that was on there, leaving a tail. And sorry about the camera problems we're having, but I'll keep talking. So I've cut the spool that was on there, leaving a tail and my new spool I'm attaching and just tying the two together in a knot. I've unthreaded my needle and now I can just pull that new color all the way through the whole threading apparatus until it gets to the front, trim off the knot, and then re-thread the needle. And for myself, when I'm changing thread, I pretty habitually just yank the old thread out of the needle because you wouldn't believe how often I go through the whole process and come around to the front and without pulling that thread through, start sewing. And then the knot hits your needle and the thread breaks and your machine goes flying and yeah. So that's just my little fail safe. Whenever I'm changing thread, I just yank the old one out of the needle and that just is my trigger, if you will. Okay, let's have a couple comments before we start sewing. Now where am I at? The one that I, oh gosh, now Lucy's in the way. And Lucy's so big. Okay, Karen, I'm just going to read the comment. I don't see it, Dave. Karen, will you spray the excess to get rid of some of the bubbles or pins be more effective? That's a really good question, Karen, because in other episodes I've talked about using spray starch and different things to, to take up some of that excess. Um, I'm being a little cautious with this quilt because it is vintage too. And I don't entirely know the safety level of those fabrics with moisture. So I'm not going to spray this one. I am strictly going to manage this one with my quilting manipulation. That, that's my decision. You know, you're free to try. I'm, as I said before, this is not the one right way. It's just the way I'm doing it. Another Karen. What kind of pins are you using? They are corsage or craft pins and they're just from a craft store. Regina, looking forward to seeing how you avoid hitting the pins. Oh, you're going to love this one. Laurel, when you float your tops, are you still able to move forward or backwards should you forget an area that should be stitched? Good question, Laurel. Can I come back to that in just a second? Because I've got a longer answer for it. And Lindy, does your choice of batting ever help in ridding some of the bubbles or excess fabric? Yes, the choice of batting would. And honestly, if I carried 100% poly batting, I probably would have considered putting that in here. A fluffier batting might have helped even more with those bubbles, but I don't carry that. And we opted not to put wool in because of the cost. So again, choices, but the short answer is yes, a fluffier batting would probably help in some of those things. Okay, That's all the questions. back to Laurel's one. question. And it, 
Oh, this is Carla. It's going to my mother. Okay, good to know. So now we know whose quilt it is. Carla is the daughter-in-law that I mentioned, and it's going to her mom. So good. I'm glad you're watching, Carla. How fun. Okay, we were talking about quilting design. For so many reasons, <laughs> you know, we thought about custom quilting this project and the one that you've seen behind me on the wall is my own and I did custom quilt that one and double wedding rings can be absolutely crazy stunning when they have detailed quilting on them. This quilt is, has so many irregularities, so many points that are wildly not matching, so much of the bubbling that we agreed to do an edge to edge design on it. And again, you guys get to see this happening and be the judge at the end. Did we make the right decision? I feel like I love edge to edge and I feel like putting that all over texture is still going to be incredibly beautiful and is the right choice for a quilt that we don't want to spend a couple dozen hours. So hundreds of dollars worth of quilting on, right? We just want a finished quilt that can be enjoyed and loved. So I am going to quilt all over feathers, which is still fairly traditional, you know, in appearance. So that's going to be the quilting choice. Okay, we're getting ready to baste. We got to start stitching here, people, or we're never going to get done. I'm going to put my ruler base on my machine because I'm going to use a ruler or at least keep it handy to go around these curves rather than trying to freehand them. So there's my ruler base on my machine and the purpose of that, if you haven't stitched with a ruler before, is that I now have this stable little mini table that I can rest my rulers upon. And I'm going to grab a curved ruler. It doesn't really matter what curve, honestly. None of them are going to exactly match the curves of the quilt. It's just going to be kind of a barrier to keep my hopper foot from, you know, going every which way. And Regina wondered how I'm going to avoid going over the pins. And Regina, I'm committing what I'm sure some would call a terrible crime. And I'm going to stitch right over the pins. And I do it all the time in my quilting. Um, the reason I do is because it holds everything in place. And the reason I think it's okay is because I do it slowly. And I've never broken a pin or a needle so far. So for me, it works. If you don't stitch over pins, then you do you. But it would be difficult to be removing them as you go. So can you see I've got my ruler. Because of the pins is why I've got my ruler on the outside. If I tried to rest a ruler in here on the pins, it wouldn't be very stable. So that's why I've got the two rulers in hand. I've got the concave and the convex curve. And my curve doesn't exactly match, but it provides just this barrier that holds my hopper foot, you know, stable. And I can shift the ruler quite easily as I'm stitching, but it keeps that hopper foot, you know, stable. And I'm just endeavoring to keep that basting stitch well within the quarter inch seam allowance so that it will fall within the binding because it's not going to be perfectly round or perfectly smooth. I'm wobbling a little bit. It's not, you know, terribly smooth and even, but it doesn't matter because it's going to fall within the binding. So I just take it slow is basically my answer for this one. So that gets me over the pins. Now here, you guys are seeing once again a reality show. Small dilemma. I can't run my ruler up here because I'm so close to the red snapper. And I'm so close to the red snapper because I wanted that turquoise backing in there, right? So options would have been to have my quilt, you know, further down. That would have made my ruler use easier. So I'm going to put my ruler on top of the pins, which I know I advised you not to do, but needs must in this case, right? So I'm just taking it extra careful because I know that ruler is not very stable. It's wobbling. I can feel it wobbling under there, but it is still providing a guide for my hopper foot. And I don't quite know what happens, but it makes it feel like you're pulling against something when it hits when the ruler pulls on a pin a certain way. So that's why I keep slowing down. And I think what it is is my plate underneath is somehow um, grabbing the head of that pin. Does that make sense? When my ruler's holding it against, I think that's what's happening. But there we go. We've made it around one scallop. I don't know that you guys will be able to see it until I go back over and show a close up of it. But it, in fact, is stitched down. There are, in fact, no pleats in it. 
I call that success. So I'm going to keep slowly working my way across the top. Feel free to chime in if you have questions. Like I said, at least every pass and sometimes oftener, I will stop and talk about the things that are being commented on or the questions that are being asked. No question is too small. That is the point of these, I call them my quilting reality shows, um, for you to get to see what it looks like, the good, the bad, and sometimes the ugly. Okay, I see just a little funny seam allowance under there. I'm just going to lift my hopper foot, smooth that out with the end of a pin. So just keeping that basting line, as I mentioned, well within what will be the seam allowance of the binding. That means it doesn't matter if I get a little wobbly with it doesn't matter if it's not a smooth curve, it's going to all be hidden, but meantime, my quilt will be secured. And that's the goal. I was a little worried, I'll be honest. Um, if you're on my newsletter, receive my newsletter, I, I wrote in it a bit about this quilt and I kind of joked, I said, I'm worried that you guys will think it's sacrilege to put an edge to edge design on a double wedding ring quilt. Double wedding rings are kind of the, the classic quilt. However, my reasoning is it's better to be finished and used and loved than to be sitting waiting for someone to have time to do a hyper detailed, you know, level of quilting on it. And this quilt is, you know, not a masterpiece in terms of craftsmanship. And, and I'm okay with that. I'm completely okay with that. I'll still love it but I don't think it's the best candidate for investing tons and tons of time into custom quilting. And that is my opinion. And I've got around as far as I can now sew. All right, now we are going to start quilting. So the edge to edge design that we've chosen. Sure, let's take questions before I talk about the design. And I'll pull pins. Debbie, what ruler are you using? This is the So Kind of Wonderful um, rulers, and they come, as I showed you, in both a concave and a convex ruler, and they're a set. If you, yeah, if you do any of the patterns by the So Kind of Wonderful ladies, these curves exactly match their cutting rulers, and so they're lovely for quilting their quilts. But I happen to use them for all kinds of purposes because I like having the inside and outside curve. Lindy, what rulers do you find to be easiest to use? A brand non-slip surface you prefer? I'm not a ruler connoisseur, Lindy. Honestly, I don't own all that many rulers. So these are among my favorites for curves. Other ones that I like are the quilted pineapple. Some of you may have seen these. Whoopsie. They're always green. And she has these large curves, and I like the large curves. So those are my favorite curves. Um, they're not necessarily non-stick, but I do like them. I'll put that one away. Dave is going to hunt for the website for those curved ones. Deborah, Susan, are you in regulated or constant? I'm using regulated. Um, I do very often use constant when I'm stitching edge to edge designs, but because this one is so fiddly, I'm going to keep it in regulated. It just gives me a little bit more control. <laughs> Dave, I know this answer regulated. I'm making a quilter out of Dave, you guys. Cheryl, who is doing the binding? I would love to see that process. Mm, not 100% sure, but I think it's probably Janet's mother. Janet, who, you know, acquired the quilt um, and gave it to me to quilt. Yeah. Joan, when you start a new bobbin in the center of the quilt, do you bury the thread ends from where you ended? That varies, Joan, depending on the quilt that I'm working on. If it's a you know high-end quilt or intended for a show, yes, I do bury the ends. As a rule, I do not bury the ends, and I probably won't in this one. There's so many threads on here. What's one more? Laurel, do you go up and down in several places at beginning and ending of a stitch run to tie the knot, if you will? Yes, I do. Four or five quick stitches very close together is pretty darn secure. 
One more, Julianne. Does any of the quilted pineapple rulers match the one from So Kinda Wonderful? Mm. I'm not positive. The ones that I have don't. I have the quilted pineapples very large curves. She does have others, and I don't know if they match the same curve. I don't know. Okay. We ready to start quilting? I think so. Yes, yes, we are. Shall I start on the left or on the right? I'll start on the left this time. We are going to quilt an all over feather. This is one of my favorite, favorite designs. And for a couple of reasons, or for a couple of reasons that I chose it for this quilt. It has lots of curves because it's got that little plumy feather shape. Curves are going to be our friend in taking up all this excess. And the curves are also fairly small. So that enables us to not have big sweeping curves that we have to try and make smooth. We can make small little things fit the small corners. So let's see how that works. I don't know if I've ever used um, the feather on rounded corners before. I've always started in a 90 degree corner. So here we go. I'm just gonna change my tension a tiny bit. I can see that flat thread on the top. Okay, and I'm going to make one more change. I'm going to break thread here. So yes, I'm doing four or five quick stitches there. You can see that. And here's why. I need to be able to I need to be able to manipulate that fabric a lot to pull up that fullness. And the ruler plate is getting in the way of that because it's flat. So I'm going to end up taking that ruler plate off and on likely a number of times today. So I'm going to go right back where I left off and you'll see in a minute why that matters so much to me. And I would welcome you guys helping me remember to do that because as I'm talking it's going to be tricky to remember to put it on and off at the right times. But here goes. So now what I've got, the nose of my long arm is right here underneath my quilting area. So you're going to see me manipulating this fabric with my hand and it's almost hyper extending it over that nose and that is invaluable in taking up these excess areas. I just rely on that so heavily. So you can see how having that fat, that flat ruler plate interfered with that. So that is kind of the number one technique that I'll be using to pull up this excess. And if you are not a one hand stitcher, I'll show you another trick in a moment that you can use. This quilt emphasizes one of the great reasons for becoming comfortable stitching with one hand. I go more slowly when I'm doing it one handed, but that's okay, this is not a race. Okay, ready for the other little trick? Some of you have seen this before. What camera view are we on, Dave? Can we get a close up look? Or which one? Maybe the side one. Maybe the side one will be fine. I can't see it, huh? There we go. Okay, vegetable cans. So these are mixed veg. I don't know where I acquired these two cans. I would never eat these, but they work fabulously for quilting tools. They work as the same purpose putting them on both sides of your long arm, once again, it hyper extends your fabric over the arm of your long arm, just pulling in all that excess and ease. And if you put your cans oriented this way, they'll roll out of the way as you quilt. And you have to shift them much less often than if you put them this way where you would constantly be bumping them, right? So they can be really helpful if you're not comfortable doing this manipulating with your left hand. So keep that little trick in your back pocket. Can of beans, can of veggies, whatever you've got. 
Honestly, anything that is a small weight would work there. So it hasn't been too bad so far. I know from looking ahead that we are gonna run into some tricky areas, but so far we're doing good. So what I'm using for thread is um, Isocord 100% Poly, and it is um, in an eggshell color. So that's what I've chosen to use today. It is a 40 weight thread. To me, it feels like a 50. It's kind of like the weather. Zero wind chill feels like minus 10, but it feels like a 50. It's fairly fine. Okay, I keep being in the middle of a conversation and then having to interrupt myself. Right here, you're seeing, I think you're seeing close up, there's a pleat in this cream-colored fabric here. So I do have a couple choices there. I could try and smooth that out, you know, and, and get that seam to lay fat, but the, the pleat runs all the way along here, and it's pressed nice and flat, and it's laying flat already, so why mess with what's working, right? So I'm going to purposely stitch that pleat in place and just slow down as much as you need to be able to keep it from turning back on itself but you can see that now it's all tucked in there and even and smooth and that to me is a satisfactory result and here we're probably going to get some little pleats i just don't think there's any avoiding it but again taking the the thought that just getting it flat and smooth is the goal. Some of these little pleats we simply are not going to be able to avoid. So we're just going to stitch them down in place so they don't stick up and catch the eye. And we'll be satisfied with that. After these episodes are over, I always wait for some good lighting and then get some good photographs of the quilt as a whole so that you can kind of see the overall effect. When you're watching me do it, you know, it's a bit like looking at something under a magnifying glass and you don't really get to see the big picture view. So I'll be sure and post photos so you can see the quilt in its finished state. Well, it won't have binding yet, but you'll get the, the big picture of the quilting in it, at least. Whenever I can, I'm putting my second hand on the steering wheel and then I can go a little faster. And whenever I need to, I get my left hand back, back in control, quilting it. This is kind of messing with my head. I keep forgetting the quilt is curving down to meet me at these points. So you can see I kind of just ran off with my design. I'm okay with that too. If you're new to my channel, you'll know I'm pretty relaxed about this stuff. <laughs> Quilting should be a joy. Quilting is a joy for me. And my little pause there was just me kind of looking ahead, what's coming up, what adjustments should I make, what direction should I head in next. That's what my mind is doing all the time that I'm quilting. It's a bit like, it's a bit like driving. You're not so much looking at your front bumper right in front of you as looking out ahead, where are you going? And that kind of peripheral vision is really critical if you're doing freehand quilting like this. 
You need to be so aware of where you've been, where you're going next. And of course, in the case of this quilt, what little problem areas are coming up that you need to be navigating. And as you can see, it is all stitching down. Okay, this time I will be ready for that curved corner. I am ready. I won't be talking a lot today about quilting these feathers because there's so much else to talk about. But if you do love this feather design and want to quilt it, I do have a free class that is available um, all the time. Access is, is, you can go back to it as often as you like. There's a couple ways to get that, but the easiest one is just to go to my website, stitchedbysusan.com, and currently the little pop-up form on there takes you to a registration for that class. It is completely free, you just need to register so that you have login and access to it. And in that class, I explore this design in great depth from making the individual feather plumes to, you know, how I move across a quilt with it, how I turn corners with it, all those things. It is a favorite design. I just love feathers in all their forms. But it's so, so useful in this quilt. As I said earlier, two reasons. One is it's curved, and curves are always your friend in taking up excess. And then two, because the curves are pretty small, it enables you to work with fiddly little areas without too much trouble. And what it will give this quilt when it's all said and done is this very even, texture across the whole thing so when you stand back and look at the quilt as a whole you'll very much just see even texture now here is a little thing i'm going to show you when i am doing edge to edge quilting often you have uh, seam allowances that are bulky and any area that sticks up after the quilting is completed will catch your eye in the finished quilt so whenever i can oh you guys can't see um well, I'm going to do it, and then I'll tell you what I did. How's that? I'm going to stitch right over that little area, and now you'll be able to see it. So there's all this intersection here, and there was quite a bit of fluffy going on. It will always look better in the finished quilt if you stitch that down. Um, early in my quilting career, it seemed to me that if I quilted around those, that was easier. And it kind of is, in a way. But it doesn't look as good in the finished quilt because that makes them just stand right up to attention and they catch your eye in the finished quilt. So in the case of this little one, I actually quilted a second little tiny feather inside the first one because I thought that change of design was less eye-catching than a seam allowance that was sticking up. So again, the, these are the, the thoughts that my mind runs along when I'm quilting. Okay, I'm going to advance just a little bit. You can see I've made kind of a narrow row. It's maybe seven inches wide. I'm going to advance just a hair so that I can do another row across to the other side before I do another basting session. Everything looks nice and smooth. Um, something that I didn't do because I was busy talking was put my um, grippers on the sides and so I'm going to do that now and also I had such a narrow area there so those of you who watch regularly and there are lots of you I usually put long clamps on the side they're about 18 inches long that kind of put even tension across that whole open expanse of the quilt but the fabric I'm working with today has a torn edge, so it's really hard to get them on and time consuming. And if I wasn't live, I would take the time to fit that edge into the channel of my clamps. But because we're live, I'm not going to. I'm just going to use my simple single clamps. I'm just taking care to include the batting and the backing and to have just a gentle tug on there. I don't want lots of pressure. And Mr. Producer is reminding me that I did not put my magnets on the front of the machine. Where are we seeing me? With Karen. With 
um, I didn't because there's so much excess there. At least while the heavy quilt is still hanging, I don't think that it's a problem. Habitually, I usually do clap magnets along the front and that keeps it straight. And I will later on in the quilt too. But that's why I didn't on this pass. There actually was a reason behind, a method behind my particular madness. But I'm so glad I'm getting some of you well-trained and that way you can remind me of the things I'm missing, right? Okay, so here we are again. Remember the nose of my long arm is right here. And I'm literally using my hand to hyperextend that fabric over it so that that fullness basically gets distributed. Then I stitch and then I let go and it's, it's pulled up in those feather plumes. Here's a piece of trivia for you the other day. I was thinking to myself, plume is not quite the right word for that part of the feather. What is the right word? Google to the rescue. Each little individual part of a feather is called a barb. The problem is I don't think that's any nicer of a word to use, any more descriptive of a word to use my feathers. So I'm still stuck for how to describe them. Now that I'm in the cream, you'll be able to see the design a little bit better. Let's talk about one more option and probably the overhead camera a bigger one is better for this view um, remember how I've said a couple times that I think absolutely key is getting the excess distributed evenly what I don't want to happen is for me to be quilting across this way and for to be driving fabric ahead of me I will certainly run into problems so I'm keeping a weather eye on that all the time as I quilt, but if you're not comfortable doing that, then another option is this. Literally get your fabric kind of placed where you want it to be organized and drop some pins in so that you have uh, guardrails, if you will. As you're quilting across, you know, by this point, I've got to have worked in this amount of excess. By this point, this has got to be worked in and it never gets away from you and out of control. So that's another option to kind of manage um, where to put the stuff, you know, step back, where should this go? Should I push left, push right? That looks pretty good. Drop a pin in there and then just pull those pins out as you come to them. Have you guys seen the movie, Bo is it Bolt? Just stick a pin in it, just like that. So I'm dealing with quite a bit right here. So I'm gonna go slowly and I'm just gonna do my best to stretch that out a little bit and manage it. And I might have to change my pattern of feathers just a little strictly to manage that. And if you were to look closely at these individual feather plumes, uh, they're possibly not a work of art, but Overall, they're going to look good, and I got that area stitched down with no pleats. I call that a win.
take this pin out. And we've arrived at the next pin. Once again, this, this melon centerpiece certainly has a lot. Um, certainly has a lot of excess fabric, but we're just going to take it slow. Do the best that we can. It is really helpful to know what are the things that catch the eye. You know, we mentioned about the areas that stick up. So even if you were to get a pleat in it, I think my suggestion would be stitch it down thoroughly then. If you're going to have a pleat, make it a good one. Try, try to make it not flip back and forth left to right because that little rill of fabric would catch the eye. So can you see how just, just knowing that can help you to manage the final appearance, even if it's not any more perfect? If you were to look at this closely too, you can see that in many places I have um, almost a little windrow of fabric between the feathers. Again, that does not catch the eye as much as a pleat, so I'm okay with that. I do that on purpose sometimes. I'll push a little bit of the excess, you know, between the current feather that I'm working on the, and the last one that was stitched down. That will just kind of disappear when the quilt is taken off the long arm, those little, um, puffy bits will not be visible, but a pleat would be. So these are all things to, that just help you manage a quilt that is not perfect. It can still be very, very beautiful. And it can trick the viewer into thinking that it's perfect. And here I've got, I can feel it here. This seam allowance underneath there is going from one side to the other. Again, something I can't control or change at this point. So I'm going to stitch it down as best I can so that it appears flat when it's all said and done. And there's a really puffy one, so I'm actually going to run a little echoed feather inside there. Now that I've done that twice, I'm thinking to myself, you know, I'm just going to do that on purpose every so often, and that is going to look like part of my design.
And here we are, almost at the end of our pass. I'm going to grab myself a quick drink. And you guys have any questions, now's the time to be typing them into the comment screen. And I'll have a look at those while I'm advancing. And you maybe saw there, I did get a little pleat that turned back on itself. Um, each to their own. I'm choosing not to go back and undo it. If you wanted to, you certainly could. It's quite small. I'm choosing to leave it. All right, so I'm taking all my side clips off, making sure all my pins are out, making sure I picked up my ruler. Um, good, I will need that other ruler. Are we able to, we, the lighting is not great for seeing the whole thing, is it? I don't know that I'm gonna be able to show you guys the great result until we sort of get to the end. Um, let me move Lucy so you can get at least a bit of a view. And you won't really be able to see the quilting and that's all right, but what you will be able to see is that it's laying nice and flat now and it looks like a quilt. It's taking on the properties of a quilt. This is the magic, the magic that I love. Can you just see that lays so nice and flat? Actually, we're gonna do a little treat for you guys. Bear with us, because this is kind of experimental. Dave is gonna grab the one camera and go mobile so he can show you it. And I'll go get some bobbins loading while he does that. How's that? So enjoy the view. And yeah, this will just kind of give you that bird's eye view of how it's turning out. This is the part I love, just seeing it become a quilt and not just a gnarly piece of fabric. He's a little wobbly. <laughs> He's blaming it on the coffee. Okay, so I am advancing. Now, again, I've mentioned um, my Lucy has a 26 inch throat, which is, which is quite large. Um, it's almost arm's length if I have it all the way to the back. So I'm not going to advance it fully. It's difficult to quilt fiddly stuff at arm's length, as you might imagine. So I'm just going to do a partial advance, just enough that I think it's comfortable for sewing on and also enough that I'm able to see visually this line, right? That's a, there's no straight lines in this quilt, no straight seams, but at least the lineup of the centers of these, um, of the rings, I can visually, you know, ensure that I'm getting a pretty straight product going on here. That looks nice and flat. Okay, let's take some questions and I'll be putting in some pins. Susan Clark, side clamp the backing and the batting. Um, I did Susan with, cause I was using the single clamps, right? And I feel like if I only grab the backing, it, it pulls more sharply in that one particular area. If I grab the batting with it, it's more a distributed pull. Does that make sense? That's just my impression. There's no real scientific reason behind that one. And we have another Christine. May not matter to the quilting process, but I would like to know if the quilt is hand pieced or pieced by machine. It is pieced by machine. And I would say the lady's machine had very poor tension, which is why we have all this cream that is bunched up against the print consistently. Whichever one she had on the bottom, which I'm guessing was the cream, pulled up, you know, excess, more than she needed into the prints and colors. So again, I'm just putting a pin every eight inches or so, and then going back between and doing a pin about every two inches. There's not really any ruffling on this outside edge, which is quite nice. A few weeks ago, I, little, I did a little tiny um, double wedding ring table topper that had super roughly edges. So that was a, a different process. So it just varies from quilt to quilt, as I'm sure you experience in your own studio. And that is the beauty of being live and unscripted like this. We just address whatever challenges the particular quilt has. So I'll be a good girl this time and I'll put my magnets on. These are my front bar magnets. The, the rails of my machine are metal, are iron. 
So magnetic bars is a great and easy way for me to hold the front of my quilt. So now when I've basted the sides and put the bars, then all four sides of my quilt are stable. Nothing is gonna shift out of place, right? This is really important if you're trying to square up a quilt. If you do not put anything on the front and you quilt busily in here, it's apt to pull this up further. Your sides will be held still and your center might pull up. And if you do that pass after pass and it accumulates, at the end, you've got a bottom on your quilt that looks like this, right? So that's what the bars um, guard against. And they are just hardware store kind of knife holder magnetic bars. There are other methods for doing this. There are, you know, C-clamps that fit over. But this is what I have and it works. Okay, so now we've got to put our little ruler plate back on and do our quick basting. I hope you're not getting dizzy watching me bob up and down. <laughs> that's, the, that's the challenge of doing this live, is it's not always um, delicate using a huge machine like this. But I hope it is helpful to some of you just to see this process. right from the get-go and all that goes into it. Hmm, I've caught my thread in the ruler plate, I'm sure is what has happened. Let's just pull the bobbin out, put it back in. There we go. So one of you asked earlier about whether I do um, overlapping stitches. I do, and it's so habitual. I do it even in my basting, though I wouldn't have to, just doing four or five really closely spaced stitches there. Um, and I'm just debating which ruler is the best. If I do the concave ruler, then I'm holding, you know, I'm kind of got my hands crossed. If I do the convex ruler, then I'm sitting on the pins. Six of one, half a dozen of the other, whatever one you choose. I choose this one. The truth of the matter is, this can even be done with a straight ruler, by the way. Um, for curves like this, for curves on applique, because the main thing is that your ruler is a bit of a barrier so that it uh, controls your hopper foot. So if you don't have a curved ruler, no panic. Just use your straight one. It will still help you keep it under control. I even was watching a quilter the other day. You should be sitting down for this one. She was using the side of her index finger for exactly the same purpose, just as a, as a guardrail, really, for the hopper foot. And it worked. I'll give her that. Grab all those pins out. Put a couple side clamps on. Again, my side clamps are just enough tension to keep the quilt smooth. They're not pulling on it. I don't want to pull two sharp scallops out on each side. So that's the right side totally ready. Let me finish this basting and then looks like there are a few more questions so I will take them before I get to sewing again. I've already said it a few times, but all these basting stitches will be hidden within the binding. I'm stitching fairly close to the edge. So I'm just not panicking if they're not perfect, if they're not neat, if they're not a smooth curve, it doesn't matter at all. They're strictly utilitarian to keep things in their place. Just move Lucy, I'll put my clamps on and then we'll take a couple questions and I will get me a sip of coffee. If you all are okay with that. I'm just gonna move my rulers right off. Okay, 
questions, and I will stand clear of the quilt. I promise. Who have we got? Mickey, the feathers are beautiful on this quilt. Good choice. I think so. I think so. It'll be great to see the whole thing when it's all done and see how that big picture looks. Linda, the feathers are without a doubt taking up the fullness. A good choice. Yes. Um, Karen, can you show a close-up of the magnets? Sure. So this one has a brand on it, Performance Tool. I definitely got it at my hardware store, but I would say they're the same type of magnets that hold up your knives in your kitchen or tools in your garage. Dave has put a link in the comments, and if you can't find them at your local hardware store, I do have a link on the resource pages of my website, and it is an affiliate link. I get a little wee percentage on that, so if you want to go there, great. But most hardware stores will carry them. They're incredibly basic and very inexpensive. Regina, how much room, inches and feet, do you have between the frame and the wall behind you? Great question. Um, a little more than 24, maybe 26 inches? Something like that. Northern Sioux, who would you learn from if you watched someone else quilting? Do you have a favorite or do you ever watch anyone else? You bet I do. Um, I have a few favorites. Um, one of them is Beth Ann Nemish. She is an artist by training and it shows in her quilting. Uh, White Arbor Quilting is her, is her business name. She does beautiful, beautiful work. I have a number of her books and I follow her. Sue Hines is another one. Um, Sue has a different approach. She's almost, I don't know if she has engineer training behind her, but that's how her quilting strikes me. It's very methodical and she breaks down the steps, but she does wonderful and inventive borders and medallion style, you know, round quilts. And she has tools that are, are great. I have some of her tools and love them too. Ah, uh, I don't think so. So that's a couple that come to mind. I, I watch lots of them. I enjoy watching quilting. And it's amazing what you can learn watching someone else. I just last last week, about 10 days ago, passed my thousandth quilt freehanded. That's a heck of a lot of quilts. But I learn tips too when I watch someone else because there's just something about quilting, quilting or sewing or anything alongside someone else and you pick up from each other, you know, handy little tips. And that's true of quilting too. It's just not very easy to share because we don't long arm quilt in each other's studios. So that's what this is for you. Carla, what are your feelings on basting spray? I don't ever baste spray on my long arm. When I used to quilt on my domestic machine, I used it then. So I have no problem with it. Um, I don't think I would like it on the long arm. It would restrict my ability to manipulate that fabric, which is what I'm doing. Because my, my big feature here is the fact that I've got this huge working space that I can manipulate. When you're working on a domestic machine, you're trying to hold, you know, 12 inch spaces still. So it's kind of a different purpose in my thinking. So. Alrighty, I'm gonna get back to quilting. While I do, I'll tell you a few more things. There's, oh, apparently there's a funny comment. Dave's chuckling. Lori, I know you love your coffee, but here's a shout out to the tea drinkers too. Absolutely, I support you. And we do both actually at our house. Okay, I'm gonna get back to quilting. One more thing before I forget. When I do edge to edge designs, I usually alternate which side I start on. My, last time I started on the left and I quilted all the way to the right which means the feathers tend to go more in one direction. So then if I alternate passes, that just keeps my quilt as a whole from looking like, you know, everything's been caught in a breeze. So sometimes that's hard to remember when I'm on camera, but this time I need to start on the right. So I will do that. And then a few more things while I quilt. These live and unscripted episodes air the first and third Friday of every month. So always here, always nine o'clock in the morning. Different project each time, sometimes big, sometimes little. This week is a special one that we're actually doing two sessions. So we'll be on again tomorrow morning at 10 o'clock, Saturday morning at 10, finishing this quilt. Um, I'm just gonna put a, my trusty um, yardstick, just to hold my clamps up a little bit pausing for a second. I'm realizing that the reason I'm hitting my clamps is because my ruler base is on. And remember, I don't want a ruler base on. 
you guys have to remind me of this after the basting. So I'm right here at the edge, so I'm just gonna go off into the basted edge, break thread, take that ruler off. There we go. So here's my ruler plate, right? And having this broad space inhibits my ability to manipulate the fabric. So off it comes. Okay, back to the quilt. Clamps back on and where we were in our story. Okay, we were talking about these episodes. Yes, they air first and third Friday of every month. Um, a different project each time, usually different challenges involved. Um, yeah, but really always with the goal of just showing you what it looks like to process a quilt in my studio. And um, generally the quilts that I'm working on are client quilts, and so I do it with their permission. And it's just kind of fun to feature the different things that you run up against as a long arm quilter. There's my little inner feather coming along again. I'm purposely tucking that in here and there so it looks like a design choice, which it now is because I chose it. What else shall I tell these fine folks about? If freehand quilting is something that you've been wanting to explore and learn, I do offer a master class. Um, lots and lots of details are available on my website or you're free to email me info at stitchedbysusan.com but this master class is a six module really deep dive into this topic so both the theory kind of behind it of what I think makes a good repeatable freehand design also some of my favorite tools and then, of course, a repertoire of about 35 different freehand designs. So I demo them all on the long arm, talk you through them step by step. And then with the class, um, I, don't, I don't have it running all the time. I run it in sessions so that I can be involved. So with the class, you get access to a Facebook group in which I'm active and, you know, the freedom to ask questions and things like that. So if this is something that you love and want to explore, I encourage you to look into that. And if you don't want to dive in that deeply yet, great. Keep coming to these live and unscripted. Um, if you're on Instagram, and if you're not, maybe you ought to be. There's an awful lot of quilters over there. But I post a lot of things on Instagram that are kind of bite-sized, little tiny reels that show loading a quilt or advancing a quilt or uh, a week or two ago, I did one on the thread path that I was using on a little custom project. And I just talked about why I chose that particular thread path. So just little, very bite-sized content. So that's another place if this is your style of quilting that you can find me. If there are any people who have recently chimed in, I'll give a brief recap of what we're doing today. Um, I'm working on a double wedding ring quilt. It is vintage. It does have a number of um, behavioral problems, let's just say. <laughs> and so that's kind of the, the challenges that we're working with today. So it's, it's fragile fabric and it's, um, there's a lot of unevenness and excess bulk in a lot of areas and so that's why I chose an edge to edge design as opposed to doing something custom in each individual area. I did not think that the fabric would stand up to that much, you know, that many needle punctures. Um, and there's just so much unevenness of seam allowances and you know, the bulky bubbly areas that is much easier to control with an edge to edge design like this one. And specifically, I chose this feather design because it has curves. Curves are your very best friend when you're trying to take up excess. 
and these in particular have are quite small curves as opposed to you know large three inch swirls or something like that it would be difficult to make a larger smooth swoop so these small feathers I felt were the best way to manage this fabric And I do encourage you, when you can, to practice stitching with one hand. Slow things down and practice it because that too is really invaluable when you get to fussy quilts like this. Um, just, just the ability to handle that fabric instead of letting it go wherever the hopper foot pushes it makes a huge difference. And it's something that just comes in time and with practice. There's our little bonus double feather again. So here we go. We've got some serious fullness in this cream colored area here. So we're, we're gonna slow it down to about half speed. And my fingers will always be basically moving, pushing a little excess here and a little excess there. I literally want to be taking up excess within each of those bubbles. Slowing down helps to just allow the fabric to shift a little bit. Get in there inside those bubbles. Can you see that happening? And each feather may not be a perfect thing of beauty. However, we are taking up all that we need to take up and the quilt as a whole is going to look lovely. Even if there are a dozen or so less than perfect feathers in it. Well, maybe a couple dozen, let's be honest. But can you see how that's just taking up in that feather and I'm just moving it around, going slowly enough that I can get it under the needle before I stitch it down. And on that last one, there's quite a, can you see this? There's quite a poof in there, but I think a poof will disappear when the quilt is taken off the long arm, especially when it's washed, where I don't think a pleat will disappear. So I'd always rather a poof. Can we see that area? I'm not sure how well that, eh, it kind of shows. It's pretty darn good, pretty darn good. That is the beauty of choosing the right design and just knowing some little tricks for handling that fabric. Loose threads on there. Slow and steady. If you are finding this helpful, I would absolutely love if you would like and subscribe to my channel and if you would share this with your quilting friends that you think might benefit from the same kind of in-depth look. How stuff goes down in my studio. I'm also currently booking some sessions for um, doing some presentations, one or two of them live, but mostly 
Zoom type presentation. So if that is something that appeals to your guild or you and a group of friends, reach out to me and we'll talk. Info at stitchedbysusan.com will always reach me. And this little area, we've got some actual pleats in the seam line, and I don't feel like there's much I can do about that other than to stitch them down as smoothly as I can. You know, again, the knowledge that it's the things that stick up that catch the light and therefore catch your eye. Just that knowledge helps me know it's better to stitch it down than to leave it up. Here too and I'm just going to put my little double feather in there just to stitch down some of that excess. Alrighty, I cannot get a second pass in on this one because I didn't advance it real far. So we are going to needle down and advance. Do we have questions Dave? Should I actually undo Lucy? Okay, I will. Let me just stop right here and I will move. I'll move Lucy out of the way. I did mention, didn't I, that my long arm's name is Lucy? What you can't see on camera, my dear friend Pris gave me a lovely white and red sign that says, I love Lucy. And you know it's true. Okay, so I've undone all the clamps. I'm just going to advance it forward and then we'll talk. How's that? And I'm thinking, you guys feel free to chime in if you want to, but I'm thinking I'll maybe base this next section and then we'll call it a day for today just because I believe I've covered all the important points and it's just going to be more of the same. And then I'll work on it off camera tonight. Am I on the number three camera? Number three camera. Look at us get all fancy. Um, I will then work on it behind the scenes tonight and then I'll be ready to do the end of it tomorrow. So tomorrow at 10 a.m. Pacific time will be another session of the same. So again, if you've thought of any questions overnight, that's a great time to bring them and you'll get to see what the ending of it looks like and how straight I managed to get it. So, okay, couple comments. Let me grab my cuppa, hang on a sec. Pam, what's the best height for the machine? Oh, Pam, that's very subjective. You've probably noticed that my machine is quite high. It's rib cage level, really. Um, I like that. Mo it depends a bit on what work you do. I do a lot of this freehand edge to edge, which means I'm moving around a lot and quilting the whole top a lot, not working in little focused areas. So I prefer that for areas of visibility. I prefer a fairly high machine. Uh, I encourage you to experiment with it. Tracy, oh my God, moving the fabric. <laughs> I'm new and pleating happens more than I'd like to admit. I didn't even think to do this. This is so helpful. Thank you. Absolutely. 
And you know, it does make a little bit of difference what fabric. A batik, for example, is not nearly as easy to manipulate as a cotton. And these old fashioned cottons actually work quite well because they're a loose weave. So, you know, but play with that. Joey, Susan, change in thread color, perfect. Brought the mini curvet, which is best for, oh, for ruler work on my classic Bernina 90s. Has a seven inch harp, so I prefer palm sized rulers. Great pick with doing feathers. Yeah, rulers too are quite personal. Some people like the palm sized. I prefer the larger ones, so that's that's just very personal. Any more? Jeannie, I've taken Susan's master class and highly recommend. Thanks, Jeannie. Her teaching style and knowledge are wonderful. I now use the magnets, her plexiglass sheets for trialing designs, and lots of her motifs. Yes, Jeannie is a also a Canadian, so we have lots of fun swapping quilting stories across the continent. So I'm going to get started on basting the next pass. You guys chime in if you want to. Do you want me to keep going? In which case I can for another pass. I mean, I'm not going anywhere. Um... We can stay on air or not. And and let me know, like a couple of you have chimed in, like what parts are kind of aha moments for you? Or is this helpful just to see sort of the nitty gritty details? Because that's what these are after all. I just feel like they would be useful because I think I would have loved them you know, early on when I was asking questions like, how often is it okay to break thread? Or how often is it okay to backtrack? And how do you know that when you never work alongside somebody? So this just lets you kind of see how I do it. And honestly, some of you viewers have chimed in with ideas over the months that I have appreciated and taken to heart and used. So that's a great thing. So yeah, it's an old fashioned quilting bee. That's what it is. Once again, once again, my bobbin thread often gets caught under that ruler. I have to pull it out and put it in again. Okay. So this outer perimeter is just basting. I certainly could turn on a larger basting stitch. I certainly don't have to lock stitch it at the beginning and end. I'm just a bit of a creature of habit. And so I don't bother changing my stitch length and I lock stitch just because I habitually do that every time I stop and start. If you're wondering the reasons behind that, there, there really isn't, is basically the answer. The goal is just to secure that edge so that it cannot shift. And I might mention here too, I know that this backing is pretty smooth and flat, but if I was also dealing with a backing that had a few iffinesses about it, I'd be taking care to do some good tugs on it from both sides every time I advanced and maybe even looking from underneath. I don't have an uncam under, <laughs> under machine camera. So it's a matter of either using a mirror from the other side or crawling underneath. But if my backing had any issues, I would be doing that with every pass. I'd be getting underneath and making sure all is smooth and all is well before I start quilting. An ounce of prevention is worth a big old pound of undoing, believe me. I'm sure you all know that already. You'll see in this pass, um, that there are a number of stains on this fabric as well. That too was instrumental in our decision to um, not invest in many, many hours of custom quilting in this quilt. It, it has a limited lifespan, let's just be honest. And you know, with care, it might last a very long time yet, but it's, it just has a limited lifespan. And so we had to answer the question, how many hours are we willing to put into it at this point? And edge to edge was the answer. And also like looking at all this fullness I'm dealing with, can you imagine trying to do specific quilted designs in specific areas all while, you know, coping with that? That would be really, really difficult. So I do think edge to edge was the ticket for this quilt. 
Okay, pins are out. This time I'm remembering to take the ruler plate off before I get started. Never let it be said that I cannot learn. <clears throat> and I'm gonna have one more swallow of coffee while I'm over here. I'm getting quite dry from talking. All right. Let's get our clamps back on. Well, you guys kind of know what's coming this time. So I might talk a little bit more about the batting choices. A viewer asked a very good question early on. You know, wouldn't a puffier batting have helped deal with some of this fluffiness? And the short answer really is yes. And perhaps that's a step I should have taken um, and didn't. I used an 80-20, which is kind of an all-purpose batting with just a moderate loft. And maybe I should have put a wool or put in two layers and that could have helped with this excess too. So all of these are just decisions. It isn't a right or a wrong. It's a decision. It might be price. It might be washableness. It might be whatever factor that you're considering and just that helps to guide you toward your decision. Dave is laughing. There must be something funny. So you're probably all seeing this in the chat window. Karen, bless her heart, is reminding me. Take out that ruler plate. So thanks for that, Karen. I appreciate it. So once again, securing my thread and we're off and running. I think I will take a second to put a few pins in to, to disperse my fabric. This row is pretty, pretty gnarly, let's be honest. We're seeing a little bit of bleeding fabrics here. Just stuff, stuff that happens in old quilts. I am not a textile historian by any means. If any of you have more knowledge on that, I'd love for you to keep an eye on the fabrics and see if there's any indicator just by seeing them. Um, obviously you can't feel them. I'd love to, to know what era this quilt is from. All right, here we go. You're seeing this white pleat here. Can you see that part? You'll see it as we come to it. There's a pleat here again that I'm going to endeavor to just stitch down. There we go, we got it. I was talking briefly about the master class. Um, a new session is coming up. I'm trying to think of the date. I believe it is the 28th of February. I can't see my calendar in my mind. But leading up to that, if you think you are at all interested, here's your chance to explore. Leading up to that, I'll be doing some small challenges and live teaching sessions, probably in my Facebook group. So if you're at all interested in following some of those or kind of dipping your toe in the water, then go to my website and sign up for my newsletter and then you'll get the information about that or even just watch my social media posts because I will certainly be posting about it in the upcoming weeks. So as I mentioned, I, I do run that masterclass in sessions so that I can be involved in them and be available to, to help students and to give feedback. So a new one is coming up fairly soon. It is officially six weeks long, but you have access to it forever. And so you can, you can do it as slowly or as quickly as you want, but my involvement and in, in access runs for that six week span of time that you can kind of immerse yourself in it. 
I don't know if you can tell by watching me today, but freehand edge to edge is my particular love. So that's very much what the focus is on. There's some other tips, things about practicing, you know, how to elevate your skill quickly, things about how to use what you learn in edge to edge and translate those skills into custom quilting. But this type of edge to edge work is truly, truly what I love. Here we're seeing some of the stained areas coming up. So that was definitely a factor in, in the thought process of how much time to invest in the quilt, what to quilt on it. Got a compact area here with a lot of fabric in it. So again, just going to do our level best. Slow and steady really helps. It's amazing how just slowing down and putting tension on that fabric just helps it, just gives it enough time to feed that fabric under the needle. And that's basically what my left manipulating hand is doing is just stretching the fabric in the direction I want it to go and then giving the needle time to take that up. It's, it's just like easing in many ways at your sewing machine, but it's easing for the long arm. And you know how it is when you're piecing, you can, you can ease in a lot when you need to. Fabric is very kind that way. It's the same thing with long arming. This quilt is certainly proof of that. You can ease in an awful lot of stuff. It is really critical for safety purposes though that you do keep that index finger way down flat. I'm just puzzled right here. Let's chat for a second. Is that behind the area that we can see, Dave, though? This, can you guys see this? Yeah. Okay, so here's an area that's not quilted. So here's a decision I make when I'm freehand quilting. I look at the scale of my quilting and I've basically got pieces that are an inch, maybe an inch and a quarter that are unquilted. So when I have a nook like this that got missed, I think to myself, if that's bigger than my inch and a quarter scale, I should quilt it down because that's going to stick up like a puffy area and catch the eye. And it's iffy, let's just say, in this instance. I'm actually going to go back and do a second layer on this feather because there's a seam in there too. So between it being on the large side and having that puffy seam, to me, that is not a pretty look. So I'm just going to go and put a little swirl in there. And now I'm going to use the same system I used with that other... Um, little double feather. Now that I've done it once, I'm going to do it more often so that it starts to be part of my design. And I'm already on, what, the third pass, so obviously it's not going to be frequent, but I'm just going to put a few twirls, you know, maybe six or eight throughout the quilt now as I'm working, and that's going to become part of my design. And Karen, you'll help me remember, won't you? Mm -hmm. 
Anyone seeing fabric clues as to their vintage? A few of them have a very 30s feel, but of course it's hard to tell if that's a 30s reproduction. Or at least to my un knowledgeable eye. I can't tell if it's a 30s reproduction or an actual 30s print. Bear with me for just a moment. Dave brought me some water. I'm going to have a drink. I'm just feeling a little scratchy. Can I turn my mic off? Huh? Perfect. Thanks for your patience. I truly would love to know what your aha moments are, if there have been any. If I've touched on things that you just maybe had not thought of before. Wow. We got it. Does it look perfectly smooth? Mm, not really. Is it going to look fine in the scheme of the big picture? You bet it is. popping out those pins as I go, my placeholders, and they have served their purpose. They have just kept me from getting too far afield in any direction. zip along in these areas that are smoother, can't we?
here too we have a few pleats that are stitched right into that seam allowance. I'm just not worrying for a second about those. Just stitching them down, they'll be just fine. And we've just run out of bobbin thread. So those of you who watch frequently know I don't use a counter on my bobbin, which many machines have, including mine. So you can, you know, um, kind of work out how many revolutions of your bobbin it holds, and then it will give you a warning when you've got low. Anyway, that's really too complicated for me. So my solution is I just let it run out. And then I back up a little bit because, of course, there wasn't proper tension on it, right? that last inch or two and so I just back up a little bit. I drop my seam ripper right where I stopped stitching so in case it's on a busy print I can find it again and then I run and get my new bobbin. So I'll be off camera for a second and as long as it takes me to get this bobbin is how long it takes me to set up a new one on my winder. That enables me to use the same thread top and bottom which is my preference most of the time. And it's super easy and doesn't take very long at all. Now, of course, I didn't have a chance to lock stitch when I was ending, right? So I'm going to do a really thorough one going over the last couple existing stitches. And I'll come back and trim those tails. I have done neater ones than that in my life, but that will do. Here's a little pleat that we're going to stitch down. Perfect. There are many things I love about the all over feather, but one of them is how well it just tucks into little corners. end of the pass. Okay, any questions folks while I take all the apparatus apart and advance it? And any consensus on shall we keep going or shall we say goodbye for today? Okay. I can't, yep. I'm not seeing the camera at all. There we are. Ooh, here we come. Okay. Questions, comments. Linda, another reason FMQ is so essential to learn is this is the only way of manipulating fabric this way. That That is true. I, there are ways when you're doing custom quilting and using rulers too, but it's harder, partly because you're often on that flat little table, right? So, so yeah, to my mind, this is the best way to deal with this irregularity of excess, yeah. Vicki, a few of your fabrics look like my Aunt Grace Depression era pieces. Yes, yes, I agree. They look like that, but as I said, I have an untutored eye. I'm not I'm not 100% sure. But. Joan, I've quilted quite a few vintage quilts. I use a product called Retro Soak that has taken out many of those mysterious age stains. I bought it at a quilt shop. Yes, I'm familiar with that product, and there's a Retro Clean also. Um, I think Retro Clean is the one I've used. 
there you go. I think there is both. I think there is both. In any event, that has already been done to this quilt. So, but thank you for that tip. That is a good tip. And on the one that is hanging behind me, I did do that. It was very yellowed with age. And not only did the, the white come cleaner, but all the prints really just brightened up substantially when I use that product. So I do, I do recommend it. Orvis might be a good, I didn't see the end of it, but Orvis is actually a livestock um, washing agent. Good soap to wash that quilt in. Yes. And Orvis is my go-to because it's inexpensive and you can buy it at feed stores. It's my go-to for any quilt that's a little bit fragile, even if it's not an heirloom. Because I do quite a few quilts that I find, you know, garage sales and stuff like that. Yeah. Regina, my guess for which era made, especially if the textures vary, would be 30s, 40s, when many feed sacks were used for clothing and quilts. Yes, and that seems logical. And you're right. There is a quite broad variation in, you know, the weave, how many threads per inch, and the feel of them, for sure. Karen, removing your base plate for helping to get rid of excess fabric is clever. Having the pins placed along the row as marking is great. Yeah, and not so much marking as, as place holding, you know, for, for holding that um, fullness kind of evenly spaced across the quilt. Yeah, Joan, my aha moment today is I'm going to sign up for the master class. Oh, I like that one. <laughs> I just got the primer and watched it. I'm ready to take the plunge. Good, I look forward to seeing you there. And Joey, good night. See you tomorrow. Fabrics to me look more like the 40s. Okay, good to know. Good to know. All right, Lindy, thanks for showing us a non-typical quilt. It's quite helpful. And thank you for allowing, allowing us, allowing her to use yours, Karen. <laughs> Got it. And Joan, I've only used the Retro Clean on finished quilts, not quilt tops. In general, and I'll, I'll get going and talk about this as I go, because it's a bit longer. In general, I agree with you, Joan. It's often not wise to wash a vintage top when there's many things you don't know about it and when it's maybe really fragile. So when I did this one that's hanging on the wall, that was maybe the second year I was quilting and I had never done a vintage quilt before. And so I soaked the whole quilt top, not knowing any better. I have since learned it's wiser to wait until you've got the whole thing quilted and kind of stabilized before you start taking drastic measures. So you guys have not, not really voted for stay or go, but so I think I'm gonna make an executive decision. And I think my decision, am I on the main, Dave? I, I think my decision is gonna be we're gonna go because there's still four passes. There's this one and three more. And really it is more of the same. You've seen the full areas, you've seen the basting, you've seen how I, you know, keep things straight as I go. So I'll keep two passes for tomorrow, but this is gonna get really long if I do two more yet today. So I think we'll go ahead and close it off for today. Feel free to keep typing in questions or feel free to even, feel free to even jot your questions into the chat and I'll see them or jot them down for tomorrow and bring them tomorrow and we can discuss them with everybody um, during tomorrow's session. So 10 a.m. Pacific time, same time, same place. And I'll be nearing the end of the quilt so you'll get to see the final bit and sort of see how it all turned out and see if we pulled this quilted rabbit out of the hat. Pretty sure we did. You know, no matter whether it's perfect or not, it is still going to be a finished and beautiful quilt ready to be used and loved. So I'm happy about that. So I'm Susan Smith. You're in my studio, Stitched by Susan, and this has been Live and Unscripted, working on a double wedding ring vintage quilt and we will complete this tomorrow so i hope you'll join us again and look forward to seeing you then <laughs>